here's the content of my talk. Uh, I will show you the cyclical patterns to seizures. Then I will show you some predictive models for seizure forecasting. And then can we use a differential dosing of anti-seizure medications to treat nocturnal seizures? Uh, I'll show you the bidirectional relationship between clock genes and epilepsy. And then finally end with this newly described glymphatic system uh, and how it is important in nocturnal epilepsy. I just want to show you that uh, the biological uh, master clock is situated in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. It has receptors for melatonin. Uh, in the daytime, light goes through the retina into this biological clock and tells the brain stay awake. At night, the light is cut off. The pineal gland secretes melatonin, which goes and tells the same biological clock time to go to sleep. So this is the circadian rhythm, which is responsible for the cyclical natures of seizures also. So these are some clock genes. You have the VMAL, the PER, the clock, the cry, the TIM. These are some uh, genes. And they control why some uh, people are night owls and some people are early morning larks. And, and this also has some new learning process with respect to uh, epilepsy, clearly showing that clock genes and epilepsy have a bidirectional relationship. I will show that later in the, uh, in the talk. So this is called the phase response curve in that melatonin starts rising at about 8 p.m., peaks at about 3 a.m., and then drops again uh, in the early morning, it is gone. So when, when you give melatonin at night, you um, advance their sleep phase so that they start sleeping earlier by, instead of like teenagers sleep at two o'clock, they start sleeping on the regular 10 o'clock time. And if you start giving light in the morning, then they become wide awake. So therefore melatonin at night and bright light in the morning can improve your nocturnal sleep consolidation and improve their daytime alertness. So first is the ultradian cycles. What are ultradian cycles? So every night, people go through non-REM, REM, non-REM, REM, non-REM, REM. REM. And, and as you go in the latter half of the night, REM increases. The first half of the night, non-REM is more. And, and this cycling pattern is called ultradian cycles, clearly showing that children have a very large and a deep uh, uh, first non-REM cycle. That's why, no, that's why non-REM parasomnias like night terrors happen in the first half of the night and nightmares happen in the second half of the night. And in general, seizures happen in um, the stage one and two of sleep, and spikes happen more in stage three and four of sleep, clearly showing its relationship with respect to the ultradian pattern. Then next is the circadian pattern. So, uh, you know, circadian patterns are based on these uh, Zeitgebers, which is a German word, um, and the diurnal rhythms and circadian rhythms, and finally, the diurnal versus nocturnal seizures. And, and uh, human beings are diurnal, while mice and rats are active in the dark phase. So that's the difference between diurnal versus nocturnal. And, and it shows over here that almost 22% of seizures are nocturnal, 45% are diurnal, and 33% are mixed, both uh, diurnal and nocturnal. Nocturnal means they happen only at night. Diurnal means they happen uh, either in the day or night, and mixed when they happen either way. So that's basically nocturnal versus diurnal seizures. And we published this paper many years ago, looking at these circadian patterns in children. And what we found is that in generalized seizures peak between 6 a.m. and noon, um, Temporal seizures uh, peak between uh, uh, six to nine in the morning and at night, um, between midnight and next morning. Um, frontal lobe seizures are nocturnal between midnight and 6 a.m. Uh, parietal seizures are between uh, 6 a.m. and 9 a.m. And occipital seizures have two spikes between 9 and 12 in the morning and between 3 and 6 in the evening. So this is the circadian patterns that we see in uh, seizures. Um, in general, you know, these auras, gelastic, atonic, discognitive, myoclonic, hypermotor, and absence seizures can occur more in wakefulness, while tonic, clonic, tonic, hypermotor seizures occur more in sleep, and status epilepticus occurs more in wakefulness, but earlier in the day in older children and later in the day in infants. And intellectual spikes in JME also occur in the early morning in sleep, while the seizures occur on awakening and late in, in the late evening. So juvenile myoclonic epilepsy clearly has a nocturnal uh, nature to it. And uh, so therefore, 
Epileptiform discharges in sleep may act as a kindling phenomena leading to expression of seizures in wakefulness. And, and this is the circadian patterns. Uh, so for example, clonic, so this is day and night, and this is wake and sleep. So if you look at day and night, clonic, tonic, atonic, and myoclonic seizures happen in wakeful, in the daytime. While in, if you look at wake and sleep, clonic, absence, atonic, and myoclonic, along with epileptic spasms happen in wakefulness while tonic seizures happen more in sleep. So clearly there is a difference between day and night and sleep and wake. And if you look at generalized versus symptomatic generalized or LGS type of epilepsies, in general, uh, both in idiopathic and symptomatic generalized, they happen more in wakefulness. Um, so you can see over here, this is wake versus sleep, both in idiopathic and uh, LGS, and they are more in, in wakefulness. Um, and, and this one is night and day, and they are equal in distribution. So the conclusion for this slide is that uh, both idiopathic and symptomatic generalized epilepsies happen more in wakefulness. And when we looked at lesional epilepsy, what we found is that temporal lobe seizures occur more frequently during wakefulness, while extratemporal happened um, uh, as compared to extratemporal. And sleep, not the clock time, provides a more robust stimulus in, because in frontal lobe seizures, you can have seizures not only in sleep, but also in daytime naps. So sleep is the driver for frontal lobe and wakefulness for temporal lobe. If you look at epileptic spasm, same thing. You can see that it, uh, this is uh, all the epileptic spasms. This is uh, below three years, and this is above three years. And epileptic spa spasms below three years uh, cluster between 9 and 12 in the morning, while the epileptic spasms above three years cluster between 6 and 9 a.m., showing that clearly the infantile spasms, when they evolve into Lennox Castro, their timings are different, and therefore their simulation their, their nature is different and they should be classified differentially in the ILA classification. They look the same, epileptic spasms, but LGS happens earlier and infantile spasms happen later in the day. And then multidian patterns is a new pattern that has been described because of uh, Neuropace uh, RNS data. And you can see that this is a physician log. This is an online seizure diary. These are implantable EEG electrodes with seizures and same in, uh, uh, EEG electro electrodes implanted with intraictal spikes. And all of them show this circadian pa uh, multidian patterns where you can have an average cycling time every 20 to 35 days, but rapid cycling can happen between 7 to 10 or 14 to 15 days. Clearly showing that seizures have a pattern where they cluster every two to three weeks for unknown reasons, both spikes and seizures. And then circumanal is another type of, uh, circanal is another type of seizure patterns where on winter months, so January, December, and in cloudy uh, times, seizures happen more. Uh, and, and so it shows over here across the whole year, seizures clusters happen more in winter season and when there is less of sunlight and the sky is cloudy. So this is circ anal pattern. So these are different uh, cyclical patterns to seizures. And so if you have differential dosing, you can use, instead of using 50% of the medicine in the morning and 50% at night, if you give 75% at night and 25% in the morning, morning, the seizures which were happening here drop dramatically because you're giving a higher dose at night. And so when you do a pharmacokinetic modeling of this uh, trough and peak effects, you can clearly see that in, at night, when you give a differential dosing, your peak is high. And in the daytime, your peak is low. And that is the reason why they have better uh, control of seizures if you have nocturnal seizures. So the next is seizure forecasting. Can you forecast when the seizure will happen? Because that's important. If you can forecast when seizures will happen, then you can give more medications, you can prevent driving during that time, you can um, do a lot of things if you can predict that. So, so this is a model where ideally, if the seizure is happening here and you can predict it an hour before, that's great. You can say, don't drive, take an extra dose of medicine. Can we do that? So to do that, 
you have multiple models over here. And, and all these models basically, in this case, they have shown that the cyclical pattern uh, is every three days and here every seven days. So, you know, if you can know that, that every three days you're going to have a seizure, you can predict that you're having a seizure. Every seven days you're having a seizure, you can predict that you're having a seizure. The red dot shows that your prediction is correct. But once in a way, you can get white dots where they are not correct. So 90% time, you will be right. 20% time, 30% time, you may be wrong. And, and this is what the probabilistic forecasting probability is. So ideally, you should have the two lines near to each, the actual ones. The F1 is underperforming. The F2 is overperforming. And here, the F3 is underperforming. This is overperforming. And... In real life, this is how it will happen. Sometimes it overperforms, sometimes it underperforms. So this is what is known as forecasted probability. And you can use the same model using a Bay Bayesian method and Briar skill scores to predict based on uh, the neuropace data, uh, uh, on, based on interictal activity. So every time there is a spike, a little time after that, you're going to have a seizure. Based on that, you can see the seizure prediction is perfect, except once in a way, this white dot means seizure was not correctly predicted. This white dot means the seizure is not correctly predicted. So based on the interictal spikes, you can predict when the seizure will happen. Another way of doing it is looking at uh, uh, patients who have um, uh, diurnal patterns. So, for example, if the seizures happen only at night versus only in the day versus different times of the day, you can pre do a predictive model and again predict when the seizure will likely happen. So, this is another predictive model using uh, circadian patterns. And then the last thing is using actual ECOM data that this is a pre uh, EEG signature. And if you predict that within the next couple of hours, you're going to have a seizure. So you need to give, be more vigilant during this time. So this is uh, uh, deterministic forecasting using live ECOG data. So these are three different models of predicting seizures based on interictal spikes, based on ictal EEG data, and based on uh, circadian patterns to seizures. So you have many clock genes uh, which have a bi-directional uh, relationship. So, for example, uh, the potassium channels, these genes control clock uh, and also epilepsy. This is another one, the G-protein gated inward uh, rectifying or GERC channels, uh, which control both epilepsy and um, uh, sleep. Here's another one, the NPY gene on the PER2 clock gene con controls absence epilepsy. Here's another one. The BMAL uh, activity leads to seizures and epilepsy the, with the mTOR pathway. Uh, there's a RORA clock gene which causes epilepsy. There's a FBXL3 clock gene which leads to uh, CLN5 uh, mutations and SCN1A can also uh, have some clock inter changes with uh, SUDEP as a mechanism. So you can see that clock genes control epilepsy and epilepsy controls clock genes. And finally, this glymphatic system, this is the newly described system uh, which controls clearing of all the waste product from the brain through the uh, interstitial fluids um, on a continuous basis. The important thing is that glymphatics are more active at night. And so therefore, if the glymphatics get affected, then the clearing of waste doesn't happen. And that's why seizures happen more at night. So that's the explanation of glymphatics in simplistic words. Uh, and that's basically what it is. And same thing is applicable for TBI, stroke, migraine, and Alzheimer's, where uh, if the glymphatics don't work well, you get more uh, disease progression. And this is just a, a diagram to show how uh, orexin, which uh, is altered in epilepsy, uh, has to be cleared by the glymphatic system. And so the interaction between orexin and the glymphatics leads to a worsening of epilepsy in the night. I think I've shown you in conclusion that there are cyclical patterns to seizures. There are predictive models. You can use differential dosing of medications. I've shown you the bi-direction relation between clock genes and epilepsy. And I've shown you the glymphatics and epilepsy again. And finally, thank you very much.